it's my pleasure to I would try and concise it. I've made the presentation with a view that there are a lot of uh, general physicians, obstetricians, and uh, pediatricians. So I wouldn't go into in depth. CBC Council involved, how the tests were done, and how to interpret the CBC and approach of uh, anemia in general. And I have uh, five or six uh, case presentations just to quickly go through how simple the anemia could be or how complicated the anemia could be. Historically, if you look at the hemoglobin estimations, this is where I've trained in, um, at the time when I did my medical school in physiology, you've got a Salis hemoglobinometer. Prior to that, you've got a color comparators to look at hemoglobin estimation. We moved away from Salis and then for differentials, we did a Newbar Chambers. So it is historical invest. Here as well, we, a lot of for corporate hospitals, it's all historical. We still see somewhere in the rural practice, people still practice this. There's a lot of downside to it. There is no precision. There is no reproducibility. We should all make it historical. And modern day hematology labs, we've got semi-automated machines, a complete automated machines where the labs are doing over 2,000 CBCs every day. There's a lot of uh, automation done. All the point. normal results are sent to interface and printed out. Abnormal results are made into flags and a person looks at it and makes films and uh, go further. So there is a stepwise process in analyzing that. And obviously for standardization, you've got vacutainers, so it's a correct uh, amount of blood. Uh, a newer techniques in identifying things. A flow cytometry has revolutionized the way we do things. And we've got a flow cytometry to identify the cell markers, and we've got a genetic markers, cytogenetics, and fish technology, and a molecular diagnostics to further identify, especially in cancer diagnosis, we want a evidence-based medicine, we want our responses to treatment to be a deeper level at a molecular level. And it's just the picture of the advance in you know, different technologies and hematology is rocketing, I would say. And this is the principle I would just want to briefly say about flow cytometry, which has revolutionized the way we do tests. So this is a, a liquefied solution which is passing through this uh, pipette and each cell is counted with a laser and the cell is counting the cell volume. So the laser, the, that amount of light is blocked, that's considered as the volume and whatever the granules inside are reflecting back, so that's called a side scatter. So you are identifying which are neutrophils, eosinophils and then it's, th this is how the, the measurement is done for volume and the granules inside. And this is how the histograms are, appear. Do you have a pointer? So if we look at on the first one, in the corner you've got a lot of yellow. You've got this lot of yellow. So it depends on less volume and less granules. You've got lymphocytes here. Generally, if you're looking at the plots, you've got a very large cells here very very large voluminous cells it depends which one you're putting on the x and y axis so you know the lymphocytes are small with no granules and then thereby you can identify if there's any abnormal cells or not and these are like red cell volume how they're coming on there are a lot of uh, immature cells spirocytes they're large reticulocytes this is how the distribution width is seen and these are for the platelets if you've got somebody who are regenerating platelets you've got a larger size of the platelets so you the curve is going that way so this is the way people analyze in the lab so i just put up a cbc report if it is done in um, almost uh, a secondary setup you see a lot of patients coming with this almost all the tests are done except absolute differential counts but when this is translated into their official report, they only give hemoglobin, white cell count, and platelets. They don't put any of the rest of the parameters. And when they come to corporate hospital for further analysis, we end up repeating. Because first thing in anemia I want to see is, is the white cells normal, platelets normal? What is the MCV? Is it microcytic, macrocytic, normocytic? That information is not available in 80% of the CBCs I see in day-to-day -day practice, which come from rural practice. I urge people to produce all this report and uh, make use of this. So, just to, uh, this is a differential count. You're looking at absolute neutrophil count, absolute lymphocyte count, absolute monocyte. So it is good to have absolute numbers. So you know when to refer a patient if these absolute numbers are persistent above certain numbers. 
So the first thing before any cytopenia I would look at is, is a single cytopenia, bicytopenia, or is it pancytopenia? Next thing I would look at what is the MCV and the RBC count, look at the blood film, any abnormal cells, and what is the reticulocyte count, and hematinics. Of course, it's very important to ensure renal functions normal in any patient with anemia. So again, clinical history, examination, and uh, these go hand in hand without saying that we got to do for every patient. And it's important to see onset of symptoms. When somebody comes with anemia, do they have any previous reports? It tells us how far this has been there. If it's something very acute in a month or two, you have to be very suspicious of malignant conditions coming on. So if you step back and look at the process, it's very important to look at the clinical pathological correlation. So I would think of a bone marrow as a working factory. It's like we are so tuned in thinking about renal failure as a pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. It's exactly the same mechanism in a bone marrow is like a factory. You're looking at a pre as a raw materials. Your iron, B12, folic acid should be there for you to make. And you need a good functioning factory. Thereby, you've got, um, you know, if you've got any problem with a functioning factory, it could be a direct stimulants, like you've got drugs, alcohol, chronic liver disease or you know, autoimmune conditions, inflammatory conditions, you have anemia because of that. Or most important thing, is the bone marrow replaced by something else like leukemia, lymphoma, or is it myelodysplastic, or is it empty like myelo, you know, aplastic anemias? And if there is a lack of stimulation, especially in a chronic renal failure, you've got uh, less EPO levels or less, suppression, uh, less uh, stimulation. So that could be the effect of uh, reduced functioning marrow. If my fa factory is functioning and you've got enough raw materials, that got to be a post bone marrow problem, that got to be a peripheral destruction of the cells, could be because of hypersplenism for whatever the reason, or it could be because of hemolysis, or a blood loss is another biggest thing. It's always about the demand and supply issue, especially in pregnancy and a growing two to three year old with a severe you know, increase in demand and supply problems. I don't think we need to go into the details. We're all well acquainted with examining the patient. And anybody with anemia, it's uh, with a microcytic anemia, these are the common things we think about. Common things are common. First thing you think about, iron deficiency, hemoglobinopathies, and uh, chronic anemia of chronic disease. Anybody with a microcytic anemia, if you have no previous records, first thing you want to see is, uh, what is, is there a history of menorrhagia, blood loss? If that has been ruled out. Next thing you would look at hemoglobinopathies. And the PNH is very rare. I've had three cases. It's not that unusual in a tertiary setting to see somebody who is coming with recurrent iron deficiency or somebody with coming non-immune hemolytic anemia. That is something to be thought about. And macrocytic anemia, this is a very busy slide from the textbooks. But in general practice, I don't use the reticulocyte production index. It's not done in every patient. So when they come with CBC, first thing you're seeing is, is it macrocytic? Yes, if the MCV is high, Next thing I would look at, is there a history of alcohol? Is there any medications like methotrexate, disease-modifying agents, any other things causing? Is it pancytopenia, single cytopenia? Next thing, look at B12 folate. If that is all done, you are examining any lymph nodes. Next thing, you've got to do a bone marrow and further investigations to look for the below-mentioned conditions. So I think it's very important to know the absolute uh, differential count because we have a certain cutoff when to investigate, especially for a general practitioner. These are the, if somebody has got neutrophilia, you think it's infection, but you've got a patient in front of you, he's not really sick. You think he couldn't have a white cell count of 30, but as a benefit of doubt, you would give him antibiotics. He would come back, make sure that you see him back in 10 days' time. If it's still persistent, you've got to think about any malignant condition. Patients will absolutely look normal in CML. What they have is a high neutrophilia and some abnormal cells, which may or may not get picked up in a peripheral CBC setting. So it's important to think about it. And lymphocytosis, if it's more than 5 times 10 power 3 persistent, you've got to investigate. Same thing with monocytosis. If it's persistent over 3 months, especially associated with anemia, you have to think about CMML. And if the platelet counts over 450 on three occasions without any other reason, one should be thinking about investigating. Overall, you look for what type of cytopenia it is, ensure the blood film, there are no abnormal cells, you're not missing out any sinister cause, check your MCV, common things are common, iron and hemoglobinopathies for low MCV, high MCV, you've got the B12 folate and hemolysis are the common. Next comes your bone marrow, normocytic anemia needs extensive investigations. I would like to briefly look through a few cases, some are very common. This is a 30-year-old male 
um, with anemia and macrocytic. The first thing, high bilirubin is something there, which is suspicious. Could it be hemolysis or could it be B12? That is my thinking. When you look at the further tests, this patient has got a low B12, but retic should be normal. Every time you don't go by textbook, think about like a bone marrow, which is waiting to have something. By the time this patient is referred, he has already been given some iron B12, some multivitamins. So his bone marrow is already starting to function. That's why you've got a high reticulocyte count. And high LDH, you sometimes do see in a B12 deficiency. So if this patient doesn't have any lymph nodes and liver and spleen, you don't have to go and CT scan him and investigate. You just simply treat his B12 deficiency, what is in front of you, in two weeks' time, you should see the response. If you don't see the response, that is the time we would further investigate. So this is a younger 14-year-old with severe anemia, microcytic. Most common thing is iron deficiency. Most important thing, more than just identifying it's iron deficient, it's important to identify why she has developed iron deficiency. In this age group, menorrhagia would be the most common. You address that issue and she is hemoglobin of four. Do you want to transfuse her? If she's hemodynamically stable, perhaps one unit, but I wouldn't top her up up to 10 because it's an easily correctable cause. You give her intravenous iron, it will be corrected soon. So I'm not going to go into the details. A third case is uh, hemoglobin 7.8. This is another microcytic anemia, but normal ferritin count, or in fact on the higher side. But ensure this is not, um, you know, acute phase reactant, you're looking at high ferritin. This patient is absolutely well. So next thing we did is uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis. He has got his blood film, which showed a sickle cell. And he's got hemoglobin electrophoresis with a HBS of 76% and sickle test positive, so the diagnosis is sickle cell anemia. This is a sickling test. When you make them hypoxic in the laboratory, the cells go into sickle shape. It's confirmatory, and these are the rest of the things you think about in that patient. So case four is a 69-year-old gentleman referred from um, um, another hospital with pancytopenia. Initially, they thought it's dengue fever, which is not uncommon these days. Any thrombocytopenia, cytopenia is to think about dengue, but it's important to be rational and think why things are not improving and look for secondary reasons. So, again, he's got pancytopenia with normal B12 folate. What are we thinking? So we went ahead and did a bone marrow. He has got dysplastic changes. He's got diagnosis of MDS. But I was not happy to call it as MDS related. Because if you think about dysplastic changes in the bone marrow, they're not very evident. They are mild dysplastic features. For this, the degree of cytopenia is not correlating. So we went ahead and looked for the other reasons, and he has had a hepatitis B flare-up. He did have a hepatitis B, but not most of our patients don't reveal things. So, and then he's been treated for hepatitis B and his pancytopenia has completely resolved. So it's important to look for a clinical pathological correlation. The patient in front of you, the diagnostic information, what you've got, does it fit? So this is the fifth case. I've got two more cases. 34-year-old lady with infertility with anemia. Again, she has got a normocytic anemia. She's been going through infertility treatment for two years before they went through IVF for the third time, they decided to investigate this. First thing as a baseline test, we did all the hem hematinic screen because this could be a mixed deficiency, it's all normal. And as a part of anemia screen, we always check the creatinine. She turned out to be somebody who has got a chronic kidney disease with a creatinine of 12. That was the cause for her infertility and anemia. So next case is 67 year old lady with the anemia. Again, all the hematinics are normal. Somebody went and did a PET CT scan, which showed a flare up of all the bones, and they put a query in the radiological diagnosis, a query myeloproliferative condition. Further test is a bone marrow, and they confirmed it's a myeloproliferative condition. This is a 67 year old lady. She's been counseled, not much treatment is available. But when they came for second opinion, one thing is striking is she's got only one cytopenia, only hemoglobin is affected. Rest of the cell lines are normal, and that is a severe anemia with the rest of the things normal. You can't actually fit that with a myeloproliferative condition. So when we reviewed the bone marrow images, it turned out to be that these are not erythroid hyperplasia, these are lymphoids, and it is a Valnestrom's macroglobulinemia. She was treated with chemo and transfusion independent. The last case, 63-year-old lady who is again anemic with a, a leukopenic and thrombocytopenic with normal hematinics, normal liver and spleen. The next thing you would do is a bone marrow. 
of course, after the general physical examination to look for all the things. And this uh, turned out to be myelodysplasia with 10% blast. She started on azacitidine chemotherapy. The reason I put this is in Asia, the MDS incidence is very early. And it's important to identify this diagnosis because the prognosis is different and there are treatments available. If I, I just put this slide to say that some of the MDS live longer, about 8.8 .8 years, and some have got less than a year. So it's important we identify which prognostic category they belong and they may need some treatment. And it's, some of the MDS will transform into AML. That percentage is up to 30%. And these are the survival curves to see not all MDS are the same. The high risk will have very shorter survival compared to the low risk. And there are a lot of available treatments. What we thought years ago, about five, ten years ago, just supportive care is not good enough. There are treatments available, especially our MDS are youngsters, so allogenic bone marrow transplant may be a way forward. So take home messages, every anemia needs to be investigated and given a diagnosis which helps in the treatment and prognosis. If we are giving an empirical treatment in the periphery hospitals, we should always look for the response in two weeks. If you're not having any response, your diagnosis is wrong. You have to seek for extra investigations and diagnosis MDS should be made at a tertiary hospital because the secondary MDS is very common and you should not treat them with chemotherapy. An early referral with, um, after the initial test will change the patient outcome. Thank you. Uh,